Ah, good. Okay. Hello, everyone. Okay, good. Okay. Um, ah, excellent. Okay, can you see me and hear me? Yeah, I can hear you well. What about you? Can you hear me well? I can hear you. Great. And can the world hear us? Uh, yeah, I think only the world is hearing us as well. <laughs> the entire world. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Welcome, That's world. Good. Okay, yeah, great. We're here. Great. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. In this. Uh, let me just do this one. It is a bit. I want to get it like this because me. Sorry, just fixing this. Okay. So I think uh, that sounds good, essentially. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. And uh, this is, I mean, the live one. Uh, we, I think we have uh, started this type of this series of talk to talk essentially with uh, famous uh, researchers, professors, others essentially in the field scientists essentially. I'm actually famous. Wow. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, uh, so uh, yeah, we'll talk about you as well. And so the idea is that I mean, we will give uh, some information about the I mean the people. First, we start essentially the I mean all life essentially. And I mean something essentially bio. What did happen when you were a child? What was the idea that you were considering to be a researcher, professor, scientist, etc. Uh, that I believe it is important first because it will be documented. I think that's a good way instead of Wikipedia that we can document this. Uh, the other things which is also important is that I mean uh, I believe that I mean if you I mean if you want to listen to someone you want to see how was his or her essentially a story in their life. That also I mean especially successful person I think that is important that you know about him or her before listening to him because that may add even more weight to the things that uh, he or she is talking about. So that's the idea. So in all of these lives, essentially, in this series, we start essentially, we talk, I mean, with our guest. Uh, I mean, see, I mean, something a little bit about the life, uh, etc. And after that, we will go essentially and uh, talk about, I mean, some of the areas that the guest is essentially, uh, is uh, has expertise in it. And we discuss, I mean, we try to essentially go high level such that it is understandable by everyone. Also, in some places, we may go a bit deeper and mention something that's like an open problem or a state of the art, such that if others want to work on it, then we can work on it. And uh, so that's the thing that we are essentially uh, uh, doing uh, today with uh, Professor al -Kasarch. And... Uh, one other thing that uh, I think uh, we have a very good uh, set of topics essentially about uh, having a successful uh, blog essentially. Like, uh, probably Bill's uh, blog with Lance Fortnoy is one of the most famous essentially blogs in uh, computer science, I will say, and one of the early ones essentially. We talk about also he's working on uh, like uh, complexity and essentially the cryptography and uh, Actually, he's teaching my son, nine years old son, about <laughs> crypto. He knows actually more than me I, for some <laughs> area. But uh, we are talking about it. And especially, I think we had this, uh, I mean, it's a bit request from previous week that we should talk more about uh, zero knowledge and Zcash. That, I mean, we are talking essentially together, essentially, on that one. So that's also one thing that you can uh, hopefully, uh, I mean, learn and we will put uh, all of this essentially also on uh, YouTube and I suggest that I mean if you want to use it as a podcast that's the way that I'm doing when I'm going for exercise I may essentially listen or if, when I drive essentially I don't uh, watch it but I just I can just listen it and nowadays almost every carrier gives you unlimited essentially things and I may have some podcast later on currently we don't have podcast we have this one but you can use it as a podcast yeah that's the uh, uh, this and now, without any further ado, we are going and essentially welcome our guest, uh, Professor Gasarch of uh, University of Maryland. Like uh, he, ha he got uh, his PhD from uh, Harvard. He has, uh, I mean, he's working on crypto stuff and uh, like uh, MP versus P essentially stuff. And we have a book. We can talk more about it as well. Uh, that it's coming up, and uh, also he has a very famous essentially blog, as I mentioned, like one of the most uh, famous. Uh, blog in computer science essentially and he can talk about essentially that experience 
what are the things that you can do if you want to have a successful blog and so on and so forth. Okay, so without any uh, any further things, uh, <laughs> we will go there. And, okay, so do you want to just introduce, say something about yourself and then we can yeah. talk more? Yeah, so first off, so how about I begin with how I got into the field? Is that good? Yeah, yeah that's not okay, good. Yeah. I mean, you can so, get it out to your child, essentially. It may start from when you were a child and... Yes, okay, yes. Okay, so um, when I was in eighth grade, uh, for those who don't know, the new math was this idea, probably a bad idea, of teaching kids things like commutative, associative. The joke is you would know that three plus two is two plus three, but not know it equals five. But uh, I was actually uh, taught the new math, but I liked it. And in eighth grade, I was very interested uh -huh. in finding an operation that was commutative, but not associative. And I found one. It was uh, f of x, in current terminology, f of xy equals absolute value of x minus y. My point is, though, this, this does not show brilliance. It shows interest. The most important thing, in fact, Mohammed, for your kid as well, for all kids out there listening right now or parents of kids, the more, inter the more important question is, is your kid interested in math, computer science, physics, whatever? That's more, inter that's more important than whether they're actually good at it, because that will come later. Um, in ninth grade, I, I, I learned from my teacher that there was no, we learned the quadratic equation. Oh, I learned there's no fifth, I learned there was a cubic and a fourth degree equation, but no fifth degree. That fascinated me. I want us to know why you couldn't find a fifth degree equation. More generally, I will say now what I was thinking back then, but I could not possibly have said it this well back then. Given a problem, how hard is it, is a fundamental problem permeating all of math and comp sci and life. And for me, the uh, quintic was the, maybe the first step along those lines. How, you know, that, that you can solve a quadratic, can't solve a quintic is interesting. I went to college, I told my dad, I'm gonna go to college to find out why you can't solve a quintic. That's all I wanna know. So um, when I found out in algebra that you couldn't, why you could not solve a quintic equation, the teacher who knew this, the teacher asked me, well, now what are you gonna do? It's a fair question. <laughs> my life's goal is accomplished. And then I told him, well, I've heard there are problems that are not decidable at all. So I took a course in logic. Then I heard about PNNP. So I went to grad school in computer science. So all of these go for the theme of given a problem, how hard is it? And if I can make a plug for our book, uh, Mohammed and, uh, and Eric Demain and myself working on a book essentially on an, an update of Gary, a sequel to Gary and Johnson. Again, the same, so on, given a problem, how hard is it? Can you, obviously it's NP complete usually, can you approximate it? Can you, maybe uh, parameters are good. So the thing is, my point is, I'll end on this point, given a problem, how hard is it was a fundamental question. And I would urge you, ask yourself, what questions do you find interesting? Pursue them and pursue them without worrying about what's already known. Just pursue them, read up on stuff. And that's the way to actually learn stuff. Just and Chris, so, uh, so, okay. I mean, I think for the uh, uh, intro uh, bill, essentially. So uh, I think uh, like that's the thing. I try to, I mean, maybe reiterate my understanding from the thing. I mean, that I learned from, I mean, guest talk essentially. And maybe that's something that can help essentially uh, for viewers as well. So essentially the idea that, I mean, like, uh, I mean, like Bill was thinking about essentially equations. We can consider algorithms. I mean, algorithms is the way that we are solving any problem. I mean, essentially it's a very old thing. I think it's, um, I will say that actually, <laughs> I'm happy that my name is uh, Muhammad and working on algorithms because Actually, algorithm comes from Muhammad Al Khwarazmi. Actually, he was a Persian, I think, person. And uh, algorithm and Al Khwarazmi is the same. Anyhow, algorithm is something that you can apply for your life, essentially, for any problem, for solving equations. For all MLs are algorithms. And the hardness that uh, I mean, Bill is talking about is that I mean, sometimes we cannot. We want to get the best algorithm, but we cannot do that. Sometimes we want to solve an equation, but we don't know how we can solve this equation. Sometimes we want to get an integration. I mean, we cannot do that. Like my son is coming and asking, okay, can I do? The, can you do this integration? Okay, some of them actually are hard, and I know like some famous mathematicians that they are just taking essentially some integrations. And that, that integration is actually our great paper. Anyhow, so that was the idea of, I think, essentially the hardness that he has started. And I mean, he continued essentially during his uh, whole life. I think, uh, how old are you, Bill? I think you want to tell us. Okay, okay. Um, actually, uh, I will tell you an approximation. I don't want an identity thief to know how old I am and forge a uh, driver's license, whatever. I am, in, I am in my early 60s. Early 60s, good. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. Okay. 
Okay. So, uh, uh, little bit, I mean, when you were a child, essentially, it was 60 years ago, essentially. <laughs> it is around... Uh, so, uh, uh, how was, the, I mean, uh, like, did, did people at that time encourage people to do maths? I think, um, uh, did well, you have uh, any STEM discussion or...? Uh, well, somewhat. Realize, um, it began with, uh, uh, there was a very big push in math in the 60s in America when Russia launched Sputnik satellite in 1950, maybe, not sure, 58 or so. That's when America did actually say, we have to have our people learn more mathematics. And there were math programs, the North being part of it. So there was something like that, but nothing like now. I mean, there was not magnet schools. I currently am supervising high school students on projects, yours on a project. That was unheard of back then. But generally learning math was a good thing, but not, 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 not on the level it is now. Uh, great. Yeah, I think that you mentioned about the, uh, Russia, essentially, <laughs> the current problem. I think after 60 <laughs> years, we are seeing the same issue, essentially. Mm -hmm. Maybe the same exercise should be done again. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, that's uh, good. So I think, uh, yeah, so that in that sense, essentially, I mean, there were some, uh, there were no magnet schools. By the way, magnet no. schools are some a special, I mean, not maybe everyone knows about magnet schools. So magnet schools are some kind of special, essentially, uh, like schools, higher schools, I think middle schools, even I think elementary schools, there are some of them that, I mean, there are in US, in everywhere, essentially, like, uh, uh, like in, Iran, when I was there, it was such kind of thing. It's called Tishushan. Also, these are like the uh, um, type of uh, schools that they were selecting a few, I mean, a set of people, mainly, I mean, essentially focused on STEM. Again, STEM means essentially science, math, engineering, and this type of things. The people, the students who were more interested in, there were some kinds of interns exam, and they were selected the best, such that they compete with each other. So that's the thing that at that, that time there was no such thing as nation. So uh, uh, great. So uh, do you want to tell us about? I mean, you went to Harvard, like one of the very famous universities, essentially. Yes. So where did you get? Where did you grow up? Where did you go to undergrad? And yeah. Where did you yeah. Go? yeah. Okay. Very good. I, I grew up in New York, and I went to I went, my undergraduate school was the State University of New York at Stony Brook, a state school. I want to get a plug there. School is what you make of it. I went from a state school, but while I was there, I took grad courses, I did a little research, and got to Harvard. So I want to have a shout out to generally, it's okay to go to a state school, not an Ivy League school, and school is what you make it. I mean, there are people who go to Harvard and goof off, people go to state schools and do well. So um, that, served, that served me well. And I also, I was pretty good at math and as an undergraduate, uh, served, obviously. And so they allowed me to take grad courses. That was good also. And um, yeah, and then I applied, actually, I applied to four schools in pure math and one in Harvard called Applied Sciences. I then realized, gee, the pure math job market is pretty bad. <laughs> so um, I sort of decided that I would rather do uh, applied math, actually, and make computer science that, for the job market. But, it, but, but even so, there isn't that much of a difference. Pure math, applied math, physics, computer science, the, I think that the borders there aren't really that firm any, anyway, especially with quantum computing, they're not that firm. Anyway, so I, well, I was raised in New York, my parents were both English teachers. Yeah, my mom thinks I was Swiss at birth. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, and so, but, but however, but it was a nurturing intellectual atmosphere. So that was good. And I also went to pr pretty, good high, pretty good high schools as well. Um, and, um, and so yeah, Harvard. Oh, and also back then, after going to Harvard, I got my job at Maryland right away. Now, that was an easier time for jobs. Nowadays, you gotta get a postdoc usually and things like that. Great. I think, I mean, Bill mentioned a very important thing. Essentially, like, I think we discussed before also that at the same time that we are seeing that, I mean, we have different fields. And uh, by the way, some, I think I, I noticed that I may say essentially, essentially too many times. I try my best to decrease it. Probably does not go to zero right away, but I'm working on it. Uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, uh, Matt, uh, yeah, there are several essentially areas of, I mean, science essentially, like computer science, math, physics, I don't know, chemistry and others. And at some point, even somebody can think that each of them also have some subfields and the, pe the people become more and more focused in very, very specialized mm -hmm. subfields. Yeah. But at the same time, we need, I mean, this is the, some reality that happens. At the same time, we need people actually that go across essentially fields even. Like, for example, quantum. You need to know physics, you need to know math, you need to know essentially computer science to think about quantum. And we have, I mean, we will have some series, I mean, some talks about quantum, I mean, with the people there as well, hopefully in this uh, series as well. But uh, that's, uh, I think it is important that, uh, like, 
if you like some area, huh, you should spend time in it. And I, that's the thing that I will also mention to my I mean, pre, uh, graduate students that when you are doing PhD students, I mean, like PhD studies, or even before that, when you are high school students or be, before, I think that's a good time that you will learn. I think you should try to learn as much as possible. Maybe some of these are not completely related to each other, but later essentially become quite uh, essentially related. Later, the same, even in some subfields that, a, like if you do computer science, you may think that some areas are not that much related, like a cryptography versus like algorithm. But then for example, it, the combination would be something like, for example, uh, Zcash. This yeah. is something that algorithms and cryptography and everything essentially is involved, even distributed systems are involved. So I think you should know as much as possible, essentially, uh, different uh, fields and try to combine them. Uh, great. Uh, OK, so any interesting thing that you want to say, I mean, when you were undergrad or uh, grad, essentially, I mean, at uh, Harvard or Stony Brooks, I mean, something that can motivate people, essentially. Okay, okay, I'll say, I'll say one thing I'll hear it right now. But yeah, so um, going to talks and reading papers is really good. One talk can change what you work on or change your life even. So I'll tell you a story about that. Um, Anil Narod from Cornell, he was giving a talk at MIT on what was called recursive mathematics. That is the following notion. There are theorems in math whose proof is non-constructive. And at one time, that was considered somehow bad. And we can't even imagine that nowadays, really. But I mean, they didn't say the proofs were wrong, just that they were bad. <laughs> And uh, now, of course, constructive uh, people don't care if proofs are not constructive. But Nero's point was, rather than argue whether the proof is bad, argue about given a proof that's non-constructive, can you actually prove that it can't be done constructively? So you might call it metamathematics, but it's really solid logic, well, work in logic. And the talk so inspired me, but that, that day I went to the library, uh, ask your grandparents what a library is, I got books, I got journals, I got journals off the shelf, paper, wow, amazing nowadays, and actually began reading up on recursive combinatorics. And I, I read, like in, in, a, in about a month, I read every single paper I could find on infinite combinatorics and also the constructive, non-constructive issues that go along with them. And, and later on, about five years later, I wrote a survey, a 150-page survey of recursive, com recursive combinatorics. My point being, though, that that one talk changed what I worked on. It really got me into recursion theory and logic in a big way. And recursion theory was one of the basics for complexity theory. That helped as well. And it all sort of came together. And generally, I want to uh, echo what Mohammed, what Mohammed said, learn a lot of stuff, even if it isn't that related. I mean, if, you know, I work in complexity theory, but I also know logic. I also know crypto. I also know Ramsey theory more than most people know. Uh, and also, I even know, well, do I know any systems? Let's not go there. <laughs> I should know more. But the thing is, though, I, I, I absolutely want to echo this, that you want to be very broad. I mean, it's okay to have a special, it's okay to be the world's leading authority on X, but also know things around X and maybe a little, even a little further from X. And, they, and that's, that's a way to get to tie things together. Okay. And, uh, great. I think you mentioned several topics. I mean, uh, so some of them I think we try to introduce. I mean, if, uh, like, for example, uh, uh, complexity, I think that's the thing that uh, Bill is working. So do you want to mention, I mean, uh, I think it might be good to if you mention high level, so a person yeah. does not yeah. just know a little bit about math. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Or, I mean, okay, okay. got it. Okay, so... Maybe they know ML essentially. You want to say what is complexity? Is. Okay, fair enough. Good, good, good idea. So yeah, so complexity theory is Back to my original, my theme as a ninth grader was given a problem, how hard is it? And this fits right into that theme, complexity theory. So let me give you an example. Um, let's just say you want to visit uh, 10 cities in America, oh, maybe pre-COVID and by plane, and you want to actually fly to all of them and they have different costs between cities. How do you actually organize your trip so that you actually uh, spend as little money as possible? You want, to optim you want to minimize how much it costs. Now you could, for the 10 cities, just look at all, a, a lot of, actually it turns out it's 10 times nine times eight, et cetera, possibilities. That's a lot. So can you do better than that? Or maybe more generally for you, if you have N cities, can you actually figure out the best cost in better than what's called N factorial time? You actually can do it in two to the N time, but here's the weird thing, two to the N, that's still pretty big and it still has the feel of you're looking at all possibilities. So can you do it instead and in, say N squared time? or end of the fourth time. Even end of the 20th time would be good in that you're not doing a brute force search and you're doing something very clever. So that, that's the question. It's called the traveling salesperson problem. And um, the question arises, 
well, gee, it looks like it requires two to the n time for n cities. Can we do better? And I hate to, you probably think I'm going to say, wow, we can do better. No, actually, we have reason to think you can't do better. Um, like there are a lot of problems that are all equivalent to each other. The traveling salesperson problem is one of them. And we, we think they're all not in poly time. In fact, po yeah, not in polynomial time. In fact, we think they're all essentially exponential time. And this is both good and bad. Well, the bad news is we would like to solve these problems faster. But the good news is that once you know that, say, the traveling salesperson problem is not in polynomial time, you can look for approximations. And there are theoretical approximations of around, it was three halves. That was a bit better than that. Three halves optimal. Actually, it's now better than that. But also, there are practical things you can do as well in the real world to get it down. So once you know a problem is hard, you can then, or, you know, or getting an exact solution is hard, you can then rethink what you actually want to do. That's what complex theory is about, proving that problems are hard. That may sound like a downer, but it's not, because once you know that, you can move on and see what else you can do. Um, and I'll, I'll, okay, so that's what complexity theory is. More generally, so that was just what's called polynomial time as P. I won't define NP, but NP complete, all those problems that we all think are hard, that are all equivalent to each other. There are other classes as well, um, like here's, here's a funny one. Um, given a given n by n chessboard and a position, which uh, who's going to uh, does white have a win? Say uh, that's really hard. That's way way harder than traveling salesperson problem, and we can one can prove that. So um, that's kind of fun because people play chess on an eight by eight board, but it's good to know. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I think uh, I mean uh, uh, Bill in particular mentioned essentially this traveling salesman or traveling. I mean, what did you call it? Traveling. <laughs> Salesperson. salesperson essentially. And you want to take essentially a tour and you want to minimize the total essentially cost or total essentially driving time or total fuel essentially or anything essentially that you want to do that. And this problem is one of the MPR problems. And I think we discussed, I mean, in person I had some blog before, and some actually live before, but this was the idea of essentially polynomial means, I mean, as Bill mentioned, the running time of the algorithm should be something like essentially n is the input size. Like for example, if you have a graph, the size would be the number of vertices. If you have a database, the size would be the number of rows in a database. Mm -hmm. If you are working essentially in ML, that's like the thing. It might be n and m essentially. Like for example, if you have n rows in a database and also you have m columns, you may consider, okay, the actual input is m plus n, or like you may take the maximum of it. So that you have one parameter n as the input. And uh, the main question is that what is the running time of this algorithm? So uh, this is actually started, I think, with Edmond's uh, matching theory. So that uh, like one of the most uh, famous algorithms that they have polynomial time algorithms is Edmond's algorithms. Actually, uh, it's very sophisticated. It's still, I would say, one of the most complicated algorithms essentially in the field which is polynomial. And this has been done actually, I think around 1960 by Jeff uh, Edmond, uh, Jack Edmonds. And at that time, actually, he had this issue because at that time there were no complexity theory or not anything famous essentially. And I think I was reading one of the um, essentially papers that he had, and that was the idea that he tried to mention to mathematician, what is the difference between two to the n, trying all possibilities, and have some algorithm, which is essentially polynomial, maybe n to the two, we call it like n is linear, n to the two is essentially quadratic, and n to the three is cubic, essentially. And he tried to say the difference between this essentially and that, and that was actually very hard maybe at that time, but that was somehow the essence of the whole P essentially versus NP. Now, that's essentially the concept of polynomial that we can solve the algorithm fast. And we generally consider, I mean, n to the 10 is a polynomial, but it's not that fast, but it's still, I mean, reasonable. We hope that maybe we can get it much better. And much better generally in practice means linear, quadratic, or cubic. Probably after cubic is just too slow with large data that we have. So that's the concept of essentially polynomial algorithm. And then the concept of NP essentially, that essentially we want to say that if somebody gives us a solution, we can check it. It is essentially uh, uh, like in polynomial time, see whether it is uh, essentially a solution or not. I think Bill can talk uh, more about that. So yeah, we, we want to talk a little bit about P versus NP, one of the things that we want to talk 
about here. Okay. So you want to talk about P versus NP? Okay, yeah, okay, yes, I will. Okay, okay. Very good. So yeah, so the thing is, so traveling salesperson problem and also the satisfiability problem, given a Boolean formula in N variables, is there a satisfying solution to it? And um, these problems, uh, tra traveling sales problem, SAT problem, I want to give you a pair of problems which look similar but aren't, and it took complexity theory to even define the question properly. Uh, given a graph, there's vertices and lines between them, edges. Um, an Eulerian, an Eulerian, an Eulerian cycle is a way of traversing the entire graph, hitting every edge exactly once. Hamiltonian cycle hits every vertex exactly once. And Euler showed a long time ago a very easy theorem. A graph has an Euler cycle if and only if every vertex has even degree. And people in math wondered, what about Hamiltonian cycles? Is there a similar characterization of them? Notice. They couldn't even phrase the question properly, or they couldn't phrase it rigorously. But now that we have NP completeness, we now know Hamiltonian cycle is NP complete, meaning it's equivalent to satisfiability, equivalent to sales first problem, and therefore likely there is no polytime answer for it. Uh, and uh, as for P versus NP, so in 1970, Stephen Cook showed that uh, satisfiability was NP complete, meaning essentially, it, well, yeah, if it's NP, everything that's equivalent to it is also NP. Uh, everything in NP is in P. And so um, since 1970 or so, people have wondered, can we prove that P equals NP or more likely P not equal NP? It's been a hard slug. We don't really have any ideas on it now. The problem's been open 30 years without too much progress on it. I've done, I've done, a sur I've done three surveys of what theorists think of it. Theorists tend to think that P is not equal to NP. That is, these problems really are hard. But some say it'll take 30, 40, 50 years or, oh, it'll be, I'll say this. It will not be solved in my lifetime. It might be solved in Mohammed's son's lifetime, <laughs> but maybe by Mohammed's yeah, son. <laughs> that you, uh, yeah, uh, that you mentioned. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I think, yeah, and this, I think uh, P versus uh, NP, I think we discussed essentially in the, some live that we had with Kushia. So it is some kind of more philosophical thing that you can think about it. So essentially, uh, I mean, NP essentially, I mean, does not mean not in P essentially. It should mean that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, essentially, we believe that it is the case, but so far it is not proved. The thing that we know that is that somebody essentially, uh, so essentially NP means that if somebody gives you a solution, you can check whether it is a solution essentially to the problem or not. That's the meaning of that. And essentially, I mean, P versus NP, the philosophical meaning of that, somebody can think about this one. That, I mean, if, I, if I'm a good, essentially, if I can say this is a good art or the bad art, Am I a good artist or not? <laughs> that essentially some kind of philosophical way of thinking about that. I mean, yes, I can say that, I mean, this is a good art. If somebody gives me an art, I can, I mean, artwork, I can say whether it's a good one or bad one. But uh, can I, uh, I mean, am I a good artist? Can I draw a good art essentially oh. myself? That's essentially the concept of envy. So envy, we, when we talk about it, we say that essentially if the solution, uh, if somebody gives us the solution, I can't say this is the I mean, solution essentially is the optimum solution for the problem or is the solution for the SAT, for example, or other. But can I obtain a solution? That's okay. essentially the problem that it becomes essentially hard. Yes, if somebody gives us the guess, then I can do that. Otherwise, I cannot do that. So that's essentially the concept of like a, a P versus a NPD, essentially, that we... Uh, 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 essentially consider in this, uh, I mean, uh, like the very most important problem essentially in, um, in computer science, I will say, probably in other fields as well. So somebody actually asked a good question. How do we learn intuition behind complex math problems? So you might get essentially a complex math problem given to you. How do you do that essentially? I mean, how do you get okay, some uh, essential intuition? Okay, behind that? okay. Uh, I would say, I'll answer your answer also. Uh, I would say, a key thing is examples, examples, examples. Work out very small cases on your own. See what happens for even trivial cases. See what happens there. And that helps you build up an intuition for it. And also, when I read an abstract theorem, I try to strip away the abstraction. What does this mean for linear polynomials? What does this mean in the easiest cases? Or for numbers, what does it mean for numbers less than 100? And so work on examples like that. Even write a program to check out examples like that. That's one way of doing it. And also, even very abstract mathematics originally came from some reasonably tangible problem. Find those problems and work from there. Um, so for example, 
when studying the best way to learn group theory is to learn graph isomorphism algorithms that use group theory rather than abstract groups on their own. So I was, like I said, so examples and programs and applications where things came from would be the key things to look for. Uh, also, it's, if you learn a proof line by line, Bertrand Russell once said, if you know A implies B and B implies C and C implies D and B implies E, etc., do you really know that A implies Z? So you want to really not just follow the formalism, but also see what it means. Okay. Mohamed, want to ship a tip on that? Uh, yeah, so that's, I mean, great essential. I think this one that you mentioned, I, I worked actually, I mean, uh, I mean, like back in, I think, 2004, I was visiting essentially Princeton. I was working in graph minor theory. It was very complicated, essentially, stuff. And I learned, I mean, like one of the best, I will say, uh, live uh, graph theorists in the world, essentially, is uh, Paul Seymour at Princeton. Yeah. And then I went actually, and essentially asked him, I mean, how did you prove this, like, graph minor Theorem essentially is something like maybe 500 pages, and there are like it is published, I think, in like 30 so papers, each of them something like around 40 essentially. And again, okay, there are some introduction and something that might be repeat, but uh, this is like a like very big theory. I think the large, the bigger theory that we have in graph theory, very complicated, lots of essentially, uh, I mean, consequences for that, and the people work on it. I asked him, I mean, how did you prove this essentially? And I actually tried to I mean, work and, because I wanted to prove something for myself. And that was exactly the way that I think you mentioned, that the people, I mean, he tried very complex problem. He started with very simple example. So, okay, I want to prove this. I mean, this is a very hard <laughs> like the thing. Can you tell me a little bit about that? He started with very simple thing. Say, let's understand this simple example. That actually is very important. When we understand it, then we can go about that. So always try to simplify and go the simplest form essentially that you can solve it. That's very good because then you know what is the boundary of known versus unknown. And then you can add to that, add to that, and essentially now you have the progress. So always try to simplify essentially and get the intuition for the simplest things, I think. Uh, and I think generally to, the best way to get intuition for me is to simplify. Yes. I think that's a long thing. Same type of thing that essentially Bill mentioned. And that's actually important. Uh, good. So I think uh, we will go back, I mean, more to the science things. Uh, but also let's do a little bit about other stuff. Like, for example, about blogging. Okay, so yeah. you have a story, uh, for how many years are you doing the blogging, essentially? Let's see. Uh, about 15 years. Oh, I had my thousandth blog recently. Oh, boy. Um, and I think it's been since about 2008. Because uh, Lance Fort now started the blog. I joined him as a co in 2004, I joined him in 2008. And um, I've been blogging about once a week. So let me just tell you about how to be a good blogger. This may sound mundane. The most important thing is to keep at it. Get something out on a quasi-regular basis. That's, that's point one. Point two is, you know, you have an idea. It might, you know, you have something you want to talk about. Talk about it. Don't worry so much whether it sounds good, whether it's polished, whether or not the spelling's correct. <laughs> in my case, the thing is, just get it out there. I mean, some, it's, it's amazing. Some things I post, I think are very interesting. I get no comments. Some things I post kind of just on a whim, I get a lot of good comments and that's nice. But also the point is don't play to the crowds. Don't never think, oh, if I post this, what will people think? Or, oh, we'll get a lot of comments. Just, it's come, it's come from what you care about. Uh, also on, on my blog, there are different philosophies. We, Lance and I tend to not blog that much about our own work because that, that's kind of like bragging. We brag, We blog about, the field in general, other people's work, and don't be too constrained. It's called complexity blog, but as my readers know, I'll talk about complexity theory, education, empirical work, uh, Ramsey theory, certainly a lot in my case, uh, even politics occasionally, although somewhat nonpartisan. So uh, I, again, so don't feel constrained by your blog's topic. And again, you can't tell ahead of time what people are going to react to, so don't worry about it. Blog yeah, blog, I think now, I think this is actually applied for this series as well. So I think this is something that uh, like I started this series recently, essentially. And I think it is important because I learned a lot, essentially, from when I talk. I mean, like for two hours, I mean, you talk essentially with a successful person. Generally, I learn, I learn a lot. And I hope that, I mean, the audience also learn a lot. And again, I think something that you care about, your passion, I think you should go for it. I think that's the idea for blog, essentially. And I think this other thing that I learned actually from uh, this, I mentioned the 
concept essentially to him but i think he mentioned this uh, idea of that uh, perfectionism is the enemy of good i'm yes. using it yes. actually quite a bit so that i think that's exactly the thing that he's talking about and i learned from him actually the exact wording i mean you know that yeah not all your blogs would be the best blogs essentially some of them would be better some of them essentially some maybe i mean like i don't say worse but maybe get less attention yeah. but yeah i mean that's your that's your thinking essentially yeah so the same thing that we are talking about yes some part of this essentially talks i mean it might be i mean get more attention i mean this uh, live thing some part maybe less but i think that's the important thing that like overall it is a good Uh, inventory for the people to come and learn stuff essentially and uh, good so uh, i mean let like, uh, talking a little bit more about blogging so uh, like uh, can you i mean do you have idea that how you can put essentially uh, uh, can you anticipate that if i put this blog this is some kind of machine learning type of thing if i put this type of blog i have some ideas i can mention after you mentioned it like this blog if i put it this post essentially get a lot of attention Do you have any essentially suggestion for that or anything that you can predict that will get it done? Okay, let's see now. Um well, an obvious one, very technical blogs won't get that much attention because you know, uh because you know, who's going to read this kind of technical stuff? Uh blogs that have opinions in them will get attention, but I want to reiterate that should not be your concern. What gets attention? Because your concern is just what you want to talk about and it's hard to predict. Uh, I would say if you raise a point you find inter- if you're interested in it I see a circle. Okay. Are you still there? Sorry, I think you got this kind of good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I was saying that. Yeah. So um, it is very hard to predict what's going to get attention. And it's also not, not even my concern. The point is, if you talk passionately and coherently about a topic, people will listen and that's good. Uh, and also it can be kind of goofy. Like, let me tell you a strange example. I recently noticed that in the, all the presentations of Diffie Hellman that I've seen, no one mentions how you actually find the generator and i blogged about that and people pretty much and i gave like 10 examples and that got a discussion going of gee you know why is why are people leaving that out and that was kind of interesting so if you observe if you if you make a point that no one's ever observed before that's interesting also don't worry if things are actually original or not for blogs and for students just messing around with research in the first place whether it's original or that someone else cares don't worry about that now worry about that maybe later but for now just get things out there and think about things um i remember uh Terry Tao in a blog he reproved the Hilbert Nullenstall theorem on a blog post and he said hey, this might be known I don't care oh. uh, do you want to talk a, a little bit who was I mean Terry Tao essentially I mean like a famous mathematician yeah yeah yeah, you can... yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Terry Tao is a Fields medal winning mathematician and a famous one it was a great blog although it's rather hard to read because it's math, math is hard hey, who knew um and he had a blog my point is he has some blog posts where he proved things where he admits that this might be known this might not be known doesn't really matter i wanted to get this out in a more coherent form than i've seen before and then that's 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 my attitude of not caring so much if something's original as long as it's well written and people want to hear about it also it's kind of weird i've had some blog posts where i say this problem is well known but even so you might not know it so there you go so um okay anyway but you but you really can't tell what's going to be attention grabbing and again that's not really my concern Uh, great but actually i mean essentially from my experience actually the one that i have i have done some guest blogs essentially yeah. for me uh, essentially I, i think some <laughs> of the things that you mentioned so i don't know it is good or bad but i think my experience is that if you want to get essentially i mean lots of attention lots of comments i mean i don't think that you you should as bill mentioned if you want to just go for it i think that is a essentially a wrong way i mean the long run I'm not so sure that the people will enjoy that much. I think you should be more sincere and mention the thing. But I think my experience is this one. If you mention some op- uh, opinions, essentially, for example, I think there was some blog that I remember that was like this particular person got a job at, I don't know, at MIT. Oh, yeah. No, let's, let's, not, let's, not Muhammad, 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 let's not go. Muhammad, Muhammad, man. But let's not go. Let's not go. I'm cutting off there. We're not going there. Stop that one. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Stop. Yeah. But, no, no. But, okay. Okay, we're not going yeah, to uh, no, no, there no. are some people essentially that I mean these are the type of thing that got the most opinion. I'm not so sure these are like the best or not. not necessarily though. Okay. Um Okay, no, yeah, yes, the thing is though and also and that's also what you you might not want some attention you might not want as well. That's also a point. Okay. Yeah, that's I think that is important. Yeah. Sometimes I mean, yeah. this is like uh, 
I mean, it's not the reality. I think we are saying good or bad things. I mean, we are just saying as a fact. I mean, this is not the case that you should do that way or that. Mm-hmm. I think this way or that way. But I think, yeah. Uh, good. So I think, uh, you, or, or like, I mean, essentially, if you say something, uh, I think, yeah, I don't want to say about this one, essentially. I think the ranking was another one that got yeah, also yeah. a lot of things. Yeah. But, but, that but was there's... probably, I mean, the issues, essentially, not about individual person, but yeah. about, essentially, ranking of computer science. See, yeah. now it's the famous site that is doing that, and nobody talks about it, essentially. Mm-hmm. So I have written the post on that, but uh, I think the guest post on that one. Good. So I think these are like the things. So I think in short is that maybe you don't want to care essentially that this gets I mean, a lot of attention or not. The fact is that, I mean, you should just do your best essentially. Yes. I mean, to essentially, and also having the regular one because I think the people are essentially following uh, you and they want to see some, I mean, they will check essentially your blog once a while. And, so, yeah. and as long as you have essentially like a constant output in terms of post, essentially, I think the people will be happy to look at it. So one question, do you feel, I mean, that there are, do you get less audience now comparing essentially to, I don't know, when you started or like five years ago? I think there are more media down, there are tweeters, yeah, I think yeah. maybe Twitter was not that much active, or there were other things, I don't know, LinkedIn That's and other I, stuff. I've heard, that, I've heard that blogging is so 2015. <laughs> So, so blog, I mean, Instagram, oh, for that matter, here we are. Um, Instagram is, has, has gotten more popular. Facebook, of course, has always been popular. So I think blogging is less uh, popular. On the other hand, I would say, frankly, um, Search for it now, um, Aronson and Lipton Regan are probably the three, three blogs that, that actually blog on a regular basis. And those do get, those still get a lot of hits. So Scott Aronson gets, Scott Aronson gets a lot of comments, certainly as well. So, um, so the, yeah, I think there's, there's, uh, uh, Scott actually is, I mean, Scott Aronson is another, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, like a famous uh, computer scientist actually gets lots of attention in uh, his blog. I think we may talk with yes. him later. I mean, yes. that's also, that would, would be, so he's working more on the quantum stuff, essentially. Yes. Uh, but yeah, uh, but, but I think in general, also, I think that, I mean, the blog, the people, I think that was the, also the interpretation that I got it is about the Instagram. The people want to know more about yourself essentially and okay. your opinion and that is i think again if you care about attention i think this is some of the things is there but uh, i think certainly i mean i think as as bill mentioned because there are more uh, essentially ways of like communicating with the people maybe blog i mean a bit less i mean it's a bit yeah. colder compared to 2015 but still i mean uh, like if you go to medium that's uh, so uh, what type of i mean blogs are you like uh, uh, I think uh, what type of uh, uh, website are you using essentially for your blogs? It's, it's not Medium, correct? It's like what was that? How did you get your blog? Um, <laughs> I don't know. Ask Lance. Lance takes care of all those issues. Uh, That's why it's gonna have to I feel fine. Essentially, very nice. Uh, I mean, blogs essentially at Medium, for example, that I may do it, but. Yeah, so I still, I mean, it is active, maybe, I mean, a bit less active, I mean, because of there are more options, essentially, for the yeah. people. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but I think also one other thing that I have noticed, I think uh, Lance essentially also use, uh, like, Twitter, essentially, yes. to advertise the, essentially, things posted on the blog. So that's, I think, is the important thing also to do that. Uh, uh, great. So uh, that's essentially, so is there anything about blogging that you want to add, essentially? Uh, if, if you do it, do it for yourself, not for the audience, and do it uh, and do it on a regular basis. But also make sure you have a reason you want to do it. Um, ha- I read that like 90% of all blogs, blogs, blah, 90% of all blogs die in about two years because the author has ran out of things to say. So make sure you have a general topic you want to talk about and on a regular basis. And again, uh, I'll do it if you, I mean, you might find you don't want to do it. That's fine. But I, I, my point is it is rewarding. Ah. I've gotten a lot of questions out there, which I'm happy with. I've gotten some responses. I've, I've managed to post challenges and post questions and got answers to them. So that's very nice. So um, I think it works. That, that's, and also, um, I've gotten the community to think in certain ways. So I'm happy with that as well. So I've been happy doing it, but you really have to stick with it. Uh, good. And, and one other question also, I mean, you need to be a famous person to start a blog or anyone can do that essentially. Uh, anyone, uh, anyone can do it. In fact, uh, Mohammed, you refer to me as being famous. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm not sure. I, I may be more famous because of the blogs. I, I, I got lucky. Lance was famous and started a blog. And I, and I joined the blogs. So I became famous. But I think anyone anyone going to start a blog, it's, what the hard question is, if you start, you know, what's that phrase? If you start a blog, will they come? And that's a hard question. How do you solve that chicken and egg problem? And that, yeah, I think that's the thing. Yeah, I think the chicken and egg is something essential is there. So, I mean, maybe you can, I mean, that's, I think for you, the good experience is that, I mean, if somebody has already done blocking, you essentially yeah. join, that was a good opportunity. Yeah. That was essentially something that yeah. could resolve this chicken and egg problem. Yes. Good. Okay. So I think if we talk about, I mean, this one, now uh, let's talk uh, about, uh, I mean, uh, so a little bit more research, then we will go about the uh, higher school, essentially. Okay. Uh, and mentoring, essentially. That you are, I think, again, you are very good at it. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, I think we discussed, I mean, with Professor Elaine Shi, I mean, previous week, uh, I mean, about some kind of essentially Zcash and zero knowledge. And I asked, I mean, essentially, uh, uh, I asked uh, Bill, I think he knows a lot essentially about crypto, to talk a little bit about the zero knowledge. And that I will also, I mean, add a little bit more about the relation to from that to Zcash essentially after that. But I think that is interesting. I mean, because Zcash, I mean, this kind of uh, crypto things, essentially, uh, crypto, essentially, uh, currencies and others, and are, like quite famous. I think knowing more about them, that is useful and the people ask for it. So I think let's do a little bit more trendy stuff and talk a little bit about them. So let's start with the zero knowledge. So can you mention, I mean, something that someone, again, with, I mean, average math and computer yeah. science, what yeah. is zero knowledge and then we can build on it. Okay, very good. Okay, so zero knowledge. So, um, so let's, let's go back to PNP. So as, as Mohammed said, NP is the following. Um, say, well, I'll take traveling salesperson problem for now. Traveling salesperson problem uh, is, as we said before, more formally, given, a, given N cities and how much it costs to go from city to city and given a number, uh, 100, say, can I actually go to all these cities that cost less than 100? That's a fine question. And... Um, somebody all powerful, maybe the answer is yes, they can say, oh, do it this way. Now that might be hard to do, but we think in terms of a prover, somebody who can actually prove to you, you can do it quickly or go to the cities quickly and a verifier who can look and say, oh, you're right. So for example, if I was really, if I was somehow, I don't know, really smart or really good at this sort of stuff, I could tell Mohammed, oh, 10 cities, here's what you do. Go to New York, then Albany, then uh, Boston, then so-and-so. And the nice thing is Mohammed looks at the route I gave him and says, oh, you're right. That does cost less than 100. So Mohammed does not need to be that powerful to verify what I told him. So that, that's essentially backing up P versus NP is that NP problems are ones where um, the prover can, there, there's the short, easily verifiable proof of what you want to say. I can easily prove to you. I mean, generating, generating it might be hard, but there is a short, easily verifiable proof that you can go traverse all these cities at cost less equal to whatever. Uh, and the prover has the hard job, the verifier has the easy job. Now, here, let's put, a, let's put a wrinkle on that. What if instead of actually, want, I don't just want to have him, uh, what if I want to convince Mohammed that there is a way of traversing all the cities in less than a thousand dollars, but I don't want to tell him what it is. It's a bit odd. This was a problem people in crypto asked about 30 years ago, probably. And at the time, I would say it was more of an abstract, fun question. I mean, they had some words about how it might be practical, but I think even then, the notion of if you could do this as a practical was not really on people's minds. But however, uh, however, over a series of papers, they did find ways of doing it. Let me do an example that makes more sense for what I'm doing. Graph coloring. So let's say you have N vertices, so points, and you have lines between some of them, and you want to actually um, color say red, white, and blue, the, uh, no, the vertices, so that any two, ver any two vertices connected by an edge will be different colors. That's the three, three colorability problem. And again, verifiability, if I'm all powerful and I have a graph and I will convince Mohammed that it's three colorable, I could just give him the three coloring of it. I'll say to Mohammed, oh, color node one blue, color node, node two red, color node three blue, node four green, and he can easily verify that, yep, that's a good three coloring. Great. Now, here's the stranger question. So that, that we understand. Now, stranger question. I want to convince Mohammed that the graph is three colorable without actually having any hint at the end of what the coloring really is. That is, he will be convinced that I actually know a three coloring, 
but not what it actually is. Kind of like an arrogant professor who wants to convince the students that he knows the material, but not tell the material. So um, here's what I would do. So let me give you a, a way I could do it in the real world, but people can do this using computers much, more, much better. I essentially take the graph, I color it red, blue, green, the nerds know it. I put tape over all those colors. He then reveals, say, picks at random some edge, takes tape off, oh yes, the nodes on the edge points were red and green. We do this several times. And if we do this enough times, he'll be convinced that yes, indeed, I, I do have a coloring of the graph, but he would not know what the coloring actually is. So again, I wanna point out that, so satisfiability, three colorability, other problems, graph isomorphism, these are all problems people actually came up with nice zero knowledge protocols. Oh, yeah, this is called zero knowledge. At the end of the protocol, Mohammed knows the graph is three colorable. He does not know anything about the three coloring. So um, that's actually, that was done about 30 years ago. And again, at the time, I would say it was more of a fun thing. It was a challenge, certainly. But the, while you can see it's motivated by crypto in a certain vague sense that what people didn't think was that practical. So before I go on to the future, Mohammed, do uh, you want to add to my description of zero knowledge? Yeah, so just one thing. Can you just mention a little bit, I mean, the example that you mentioned for coloring, how yeah. can you convince me essentially that yeah. this graph is like, again, I mean, let me just add this one. So this is, again, I'm repeating that. What is the graph coloring? That's one of the most important problems, essentially, in computer science. I mean, it may seem a little bit abstract, but it has tons of applications, essentially. And you are given a graph, a set of vertices and edges that connects them, and you want to just color these vertices with minimum number of colors, such that any two vertices that they have an edge have different colors, essentially. And say, even the, the problem of whether we, I can color the whole, if you want to see whether the graph is too colorable or not, that there's a polynomial time algorithm that is equivalent to being a graph is essentially bipartite. But say you want to essentially color this graph with three colors. Can you do that with three colors or not? This problem is NP hard essentially. And even approximating it is not that easy essentially. Now, uh, essentially, the pro uh, I should not say too much essentially. The problem that uh, Bill mentioned uh, is that I, so I have a coloring. So I, there are two, two people here. Uh, you can think about, uh, and we will go essentially to Zcash and we talk about that as well. What are these two people? There's a verifier and there's a prover. So I, so I essentially have a coloring of this graph, like these three colors. But I essentially spend maybe a lot of money to obtain this. And I want to sell, I mean, to build, say, okay, I have this one. If you want, you can give me the money that I spent on this one. And I will essentially give you the three colors. But then Bill asks, I mean, okay, what is the guarantee? This is, and this is generally happens over the internet. So if I mention to him the three, essentially the three coloring, then that is gone. I cannot say, and I, if he, like, if he pays me, I give him the coloring. And this is not the correct coloring. Then in that case, I mean, he got the money and he's gone. This is the typical thing that happens essentially in lots of uh, this uh, uh, cryptocurrency stuff. That then, I mean, this transaction happened, it happened. You, it, getting it back is much, is much, much harder essentially. So I want to make sure, like Bill wants to make sure that if he wants to pay to me such that I will give the three colors that is like, the three coloring of this graph, like I, I should say each vertex, what is the color of this vertex? I, I want to essentially prove to him that I have such a coloring and he wants to verify. So I'm a prover, he's a verifier. So yeah. now what are the type of things that, I mean, essentially a prover can do to convince verifier that essentially he or she has the three coloring? So can you just yeah. maybe yeah. explain a little bit more yeah. on this? The thing is, what I would do is, I would essentially, um, I would have, okay, again, one, one, one would do this actually electronically, but I would essentially have associated to every, oh, hold on, who's who? Uh, you switch to, you switch, which one of us was which, which thing? I'm <laughs> trying to convince you. I have the three coloring, uh, fine, I, fine. and okay. I want to okay. essentially. Okay. Okay. I, would demand, I would demand to see, I would demand to see I would pick a edge at random and demand to see both endpoints of that edge. I was like, okay, is the recoloring? Show me the color. One and 12 are connected by an edge. I want to see the colors of one and 12. And that you could do. You could actually just show me, just show me one and 12, but nothing else. And then I'll go, okay, that looks pretty good. Then you'll actually permute the colors some. And then I'll say, okay, now I want to see three and four. 
and we'll do this trial several times. That is, by locally checking that a certain edge has both endpoints being different colors, um, I get more and more convinced that, yeah, he really could not have pulled this off unless it really was three colorable. So, uh, and also, I mean, there are ways of checking, like there are ways of checking these things. Uh, with, with, I mean, I'm talking about this literally revealing it with tape and stuff, but there are ways of doing it electronically. And after, say, law, even log n trials like this, picking log n edges at random um, at, at one at a time, uh, I will get a good sense of, yes, the graph is three colorable. He could not possibly have fooled me this many times. Okay, so, um, okay, so, yeah, okay, so that is how one can do zero knowledge. And at the time, that protocol was very, very slow. Over time, they speeded it up. And I'll say this briefly, and Mohammed can elaborate on it. It turned out that now a lot of protocols for cryptocurrency, especially Zcash, use these protocols. To use them, they had to go back to the original algorithm and really speed them up. And it's, it's actually quite remarkable. Crypto often comes up initially with protocols that are secure, but very slow. But over time, through more mathematics, through engineering, through tricks, through, through hardware, they can make them faster. As another example, homomorphic encryption has been sped up literally a million fold since it was invented. Zero knowledge, similar. I'm not quite sure how much it's been sped up, but it's been sped up a lot. And with that in mind, now that we know what, Zk now, now that we know what zero knowledge actually is, Mohammed, the one time about, Z about Zcash? Yes, okay. So that, that is essentially good. So uh, I, I think that, uh, like the example that we mentioned, I think it was important that, like, for example, he asked, um, what are the color of these two vertices? And I should give the color. I think he, I mean, like when I want to present it, of course, if he just asks different edges, I can give different colors for them and he cannot verify them. I think the idea here is that, I mean, uh, like uh, he should, or I should present in a way that, I mean, he can check also the consistency that make sure that, I mean, if I mention this vertex has color one, next time I should not say this vertex has color two, essentially. Uh, these are the, some of the things that I think he should check it. And at the same time, note that he, when he asks these questions, there is some limit. If he is asking all set of essentially edges, I think in that case, then, I mean, uh, he potentially can get all the colors. So uh, there is some essentially leaking of the information as well if he can ask lots of questions. So uh, I think, so that's essentially the general idea of the, I mean, uh, essentially uh, zero knowledge proof that uh, like essentially again, there's a prover, there's a verifier, prover wants to give essentially generally just, it can be over many rounds of communication, but in a typical thing that happens essentially for uh, Zcash and others, this one round of essentially communication. I will give you some information and uh, that person essentially the verifier, I mean, should verify that I have this information. So uh, now uh, how is it used essentially in the Zcash? So the idea essentially in the, uh, this, you need to know what is blockchain. So blockchain is essentially a set of transactions that happen. And each person essentially, when you do the transaction, you have some public ID. This public ID paid to this public ID, this amount of essentially like money essentially or crypto. And this was the fee. These are the type of things that will be in the blockchain. A, a typical blockchain, I mean, your address is public. So everyone knows what is your address. This is the address of your wallet or other things essentially. So from this wallet essentially then to this other wallet, and you know that. Uh, the one issue that exists essentially if you are using, for example, uh, Coinbase or others, they, they actually tend to change your wallet because these wallets are public and somebody can attack and get all your money essentially. Because if you know these addresses essentially, then you have lots of information. Potentially, you can actually move the money there. So the idea is that, I mean, instead of this kind of public addresses, let's have essentially private addresses. So in the Zcash, we have two things. We have the Z address, which are private, and we have a T address, which are public. And then you can have some kind of transaction from Z to Z, or from Z to T. So essentially from Z to Z means that completely private. So I will essentially mention in the blockchain that some transaction happened and some fee has been paid for it. But I don't reveal the address of uh, essentially the person who pays and the address of the person who gets the money and how much fee has been there or was, was there any memo or something. So these are essentially, so this is the concept that to make sure that the people don't lose essentially the valid addresses or others. By the way, just one thing. Actually, this, uh, I think, uh, uh, Bill, uh, the, 
and this uh, Instagram actually disconnect us. Uh, in Okay. Okay. Are we back? Yeah. So we are back. I think uh, all of them have these things now. I mean, that after one hour they are disconnecting. So I actually I was reading that uh, like Insta has actually um, has the limit of four hours instead of one hour, <laughs> but apparently is not going according to that. And after oh, one hour. Oh, oh. We're here. We're we're here. We're back. That's great. So let's, let's move on. Yeah, that's great, essentially. So yeah. So we were talking essentially about the Zcash and zero knowledge proof essentially, and uh, the, and the idea as I mentioned. So when you put it in the blockchain, there is some address that sends some money to other one, and these addresses are public. So in the Zcash, we are essentially using uh, this zero knowledge proof. Uh, instead of uh, so uh, here we say that there is a transaction in the blockchain from this. Uh, and we don't say the addresses. We just say there is a transaction essentially. And uh, but in this transaction, we don't say the address of the sender or receiver and how much was the amount or what was the memo that essentially was there. All of them will be encrypted essentially through zero knowledge proof. And actually, it's a special case. It is called a, a zk snark. I will talk a little bit about it. It's a special zero knowledge proof. And when you do that, essentially, when you do using this uh, zero knowledge, the idea is that, uh, so, uh, so this happens, the people don't know my wallet address. At the same time, somebody should be able to essentially verify that this transaction happened. Otherwise, I mean, you can essentially build a fortune. That's exactly the idea of that the zero knowledge is coming, that this transaction is happened. It is done essentially, and we have some encryption of that. And this encryption, Make sure that uh, that somebody, like any uh, essential authority, can verify that this has happened without really knowing what are the addresses, what are the amount, that, et cetera. So in some sense, Zcash essentially is, the, is based on the idea of zero knowledge to make sure like the addresses and the amount, et cetera, essentially secure. And they, as I mentioned, they are using essentially a special type of zero knowledge. It is called uh, ZK Snark. This is a paper by Eli Ben Sasson, essentially, uh, et al. If you want to read it, you can read more about it. And there are some interesting things here about uh, ZK Snark. For example, zero knowledge, as I mentioned, you can communicate, like prover and verifier, they can communicate essentially several times. And here in the uh, zero knowledge, in general, zero knowledge. But in this ZK snark, there is only one round of communication. A prover, a prover essentially just send one message, and this message is a very succinct message also. Because even if you have a very long program, you are sending very succinct, essentially, message. Prover sends to verifier because it needs to be fast, essentially. And verifier can essentially verify it, and uh, essentially, uh, that means that essentially such a transaction, for example, has happened. So that's essentially the idea of I mean, uh, zero knowledge uh, and the relation with that and uh, essentially Zcash. So Zcash essentially is the same as blockchain, nothing different from like Bitcoin or others. The only thing is that they just encrypt the addresses, uh, send their receivers and the amount using zero knowledge, such that we can still verify that the transaction happened, but we don't know what is inside and what are the addresses. And they are using this ZK snark, which is using very one round, very succinct and very efficient way of essentially sending some proof from proof, uh, some certificate from prover to verify. I think that's the general idea. You can read more about it, and I think that's the understanding that I have it again. I always say that I mean my understanding can change over time. I may learn more, and I may change it essentially. <laughs> Later, but that's my understanding, and I think that I think Bill mentioned. So I think that was the idea. Uh, great. Now let's go to a, another topic. Essentially, that is also you are good at it. Essentially, and <laughs> essentially about uh, like high school mentoring, or essentially even I mean I think now uh, I think my son was the only one from elementary school that you have mentored. Have you done anyone before? Uh, there was a three-year-old 
working on Ramsey theory. No, no, no. Yes, yes. Your son is the only one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, my son is nine years old, actually, working with him, as I mentioned. He knows more uh, crypto than me, essentially, now. Uh, okay. I'm part of the uh, pretty pretty yeah. soon more than me, but um actually okay. So um first of all, I want to I want to just one last thing about the previous dialogue is that um the thing is that again it amazes me that things done theoretically like zero knowledge do actually apply eventually, and it's very nice seeing that. So I just want to point that out. Okay. Uh, actually, I just wanted to add one thing that you yeah. know you mentioned. This is very important. So we talk about the complexity essentially, and that was the whole idea. That complexity means how hard is the problem. Yeah. And so then there is algorithm that how well we can solve the problem. Maybe we can solve it perfectly, but in an approximate way or, I mean, essentially with some probability, we can find the correct solution. And so that is interesting. Now they say, okay, maybe hardness is not that useful. This is exactly the idea of this cryptography, uh, like cryptography or essentially zero knowledge or others that are used. So here we are using this hardness for essentially cryptographic reasons, essentially, for communication, such that we can do something that others cannot find it. So in some sense, these are the part that hardness come to into play and into practical things. So these are very nice areas, actually, that when you know about the hardness, it is not just something to say that this problem is hard, but we are using this hardness, actually, to do some practical things. And this, for example, Zcash is based on zero knowledge, is exactly one of these examples. It's one of those ironies. When I teach crypto, I've got to tell them, when you taught algorithms, probably being hard was bad. But in crypto, probably being hard can be good. Because exactly. you know, we want to make things uh, easy for Alice and Bob, but hard for Eve. Now, uh, high school mentoring. So um, well, the first thing I'll say will sound rather mundane, but it's true. My best property as a high school mentor is that when students email me, I will promptly return their emails. And I'm going to, I, I will actually... I, I'm actually always able to contact them. Uh, and also, um, but more importantly is, and this is actually, more, this is actually better with, the, funny enough, because of Zoom, it's not much easier to meet with them as well, including Mohammed's son. But the key thing is to, you talk to a student, first off, if a parent says, my student wants to work with you, that's okay, but have the student talk to me. The most important thing is to talk to the student directly and also ask them where, you know, you must pay attention to where are they? Are they doing a formal project for a high school that they have to do, or maybe not, or are they for their own interest? Where are they? What are they? The two key questions are, what are you interested in and what do you already know? And you then work from there. I mean, if they don't know that much, you might tell them to go away and learn stuff. Or actually, now I've got some pretty good slides that people can look at as well. As In fact, Mohammed's son, Ilya, is looking at my slides and recording on crypto. But um, the key thing is find out what they know and what they, what they care about, what they know, and also give them very easy to do, easy for us perhaps, give them definable, well-defined, easy to do problems as a confidence builder. Like, okay, you've read this protocol, code it up. Okay, you've read these two papers, what if you, what if you combine them? Might be a little harder, but yeah. So the thing is, give them, uh, extremely th uh, give them things to do that they can do. And also, um, this may seem strange. Um, I remember, I want to tell you a story here. I remember somebody was going off to a college and writing an essay as to what you can do for them, a math person. And they wanted her to figure out how can you tie your research into undergraduate projects? Her research was on recursive Ramsey theory. <laughs> I don't think you can really tie recursive Ramsey theory to any undergrad project. So I told her, and I think this is quite correct, when you advise a high school student, the notion that they're gonna help your research program is probably not true and probably okay that it's not true. That is. So don't say, oh, I work on recursive Ramsey theory, therefore I'll take this nine-year-old and him work on it. You, know, you want to see what, you know, what's best for them. And the nice thing is, if you learn things outside your area, even yeah, learning easy things outside your area to work with high school students is actually pretty good. It's pretty good for you as well. You actually get to learn new things. Um, also realize that uh, combinatorics is a very common area for high school students because it's actually not that much prerequisite. So that's, I've mentored quite a few on Ramsey theory topics as well. Um, and other things common to works. Algorithms is pretty good because for algorithms, there are people out there, this may surprise you, there are high school students out there that aren't that good at math. You know, who knew? It's true. So the point is, even so, they can still code things up for you. So if they're good at math, have them prove theorems. If they're good at programming, have them code things up. The key thing is to meet them where they are. And key things, I don't care if it's original. I don't care if it's new. 
All I care about is, do they find it interesting? If you're going to later on go to think about publishing or science competitions, then you've got Did I, did I lose you for a second? Did I lose you for a second there? Yeah, I think I'm. Okay, so, 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 okay, so let me go back a little bit. So I was saying that, um, yeah. So um, I don't care when working with a high school student or lower, I, or younger. I don't care if it's original. I don't care if it's interesting to anybody else. The key thing is, if the student and me find it interesting, then that's worth working on. And if later on you're thinking of writing a paper or submitting it to a high school competition, fine. Then you've got to go back and see what's already known. But don't worry about that. For you know. The most important thing is get them working on things they care about and you care about that they can do and give them extremely well-defined, doable things. Oh, and I tend to meet my students about once a month or so, uh, giving them well-defined things in the interim. And uh, again, Zoom's been, Zoom's been a godsend because um, before, this is kind of weird to say, the best thing about the pandemic is that I can now talk to high school students more easily. Before the pandemic, before Zoom was so prevalent, um, I would have to have the high school student's parents get them a parking pass to come to campus. And now it's very easy. Also, oh, also uh, just keep your work down load. I actually am I'm advising probably about 20 high school students right now, but it's not 20 projects. They're working in teams of three or four with each other. So that's also very good. It saves you time. It saves them time as well. It gives them people to work with as well. So that's also very good. And um, let me see now. And how to find problems to up. Uh, he, one may ask, let me ask you, go, go further. How do you find problems for them to work on? Okay, Mohammed, have you ever read a paper where it said the following proof is obvious? Okay, we skip the following obvious deduction, something like that. Yeah, surely. I think that's sure, no, surely, it is. surely. But realize what, what to you is an obvious induction and to me is an obvious induction for a high school student could be a good starting point to actually learn something. Because what, so you can take things in papers that are, quote, obvious, unquote, to us and make them good learning experiences for high school students. Um, and hopefully they're actually also correct. You, occasionally you'll find something that's obvious that's not true. <laughs> that can be embarrassing. But anyway, um, so the thing is though that, yeah, so take you can take what you're working on or take things you've read about and you're on the side and scale them down. Oh, fact, let me give you an example of a scaled down problem. Um, let me tell you a theorem in Ramsey theory and a scaled down version I've used for high school projects. The following is true and fascinating, but a bit difficult to actually prove. Um, okay, uh, Mohammed, give me a number. Five. Five, okay, five, great. Okay, it turns out, um, what if you, uh, if you color, okay, uh, five. If you color the um, points, uh, if you color the lattice points of the plane with five colors, take the plane, to take the lattice points, one, 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 two, two, one, take all the lattice points of the plane, color them with five colors, a red, blue, green, indigo, violet, say. I guarantee you there's going to be a square with all four corners the same color someplace there. Okay. So that's that, essentially the basic of Ramsey theory, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We talked this, about the Ramsey theory. That's essentially the idea. That essentially, yeah. if you, I mean, like you have some kind of lattice means essentially some kind of grid or something like this. Yeah. If you yeah. just color it with this few number of colors, some shape should happen. That like should be, you should have some square, maybe not one by one, maybe. Yeah. 10 by 10, essentially, that all of them have the same yeah, color. That's right. That's these right. are the Ramsey theory that, again, these are actually very useful. They have practical applications as well. So these are like, it seems very math problem, but they have actually some of them have some applications. Okay. Yeah. okay, so the hard theorem in Ramsey theory is that how you color the points of the, lattice points of the uh, plane, you get a monochromatic squ square, all four corners, same color. That's a bit hard, but I scaled it down to a much easier theorem. You get a rectangle and a rectangle, all four corners, same color. And the thing is, the rectangle theorem, I want to say it's my theorem. It's kind of silly because it's just an easy subcase. But the thing is, though, you can actually work with that more easily with a high school student. That is, take a hard theorem, scale it down, and you have a object of study for high school students. And you know more about it, and you can later on leave them the harder math. But now it's sort of like a good, a good testing ground. So I do that a lot in Ramsey theory and other fields, so essentially, Scale things down and see what happens. Okay, and um, so again, so, so let me just sum that, sum that up. Always be in contact with them. Give them well-defined things to do. Give them things that they can do um, and make sure that it's things they're interested in and don't care about originality and scale down your own research projects and don't be so tied up with your research projects. Like 
Um, you can do things outside your area as well that aren't that area. Also realize, I think if you're a college professor in math and comp science, you know a lot of stuff. Working outside your... I mean, one thing here. So essentially for the audience, I think we are here, we are talking about two essentially side of the game in some sense. Yes. We will call it the game. So there are essentially, I think there are all of us, I mean, like me, essentially, I'm a parent, I'm a professor. <laughs> so essentially, so I think the audience, I mean, generally, they might be parents, essentially, they might essentially be, I mean, professor. So, and the idea here is that, I mean, like... Uh, how like if uh, I have a son or a daughter essentially like you do have a son in or, school, think, or even higher school or uh, middle school, how can I encourage him or her to do essentially more math essentially? That's one side of the thing, and the other one is that like if I am a professor mm -hmm. and I want to help such a higher school thing, that is I think that is actually very important. Bill is very good at it. I try to be good at it. I'm like sometimes busy. Lots of professor might be busy, but I think it's very important. This is a very good investment, essentially, in independent of where do you live, essentially. It is very important. If you can spend some time for this, essentially, uh, high school or like even like elementary or middle school people, uh, such that they become essentially great researcher before. And I personally believe the same way that the people say that the best time to learn, essentially, in like, Second language, and when essentially, I don't know, five years old or something like this. I learned English, I think I was much uh, older. I'm not so sure that my English I means, I mean, like, I try to be essentially good, but, you know, it's not perfect. My son's English is much better than yeah. me. Yeah. That I, I cannot say. Like, he's essentially, uh, uh, I mean, he cannot speak, I mean, because he was talking essentially this from the beginning. So, uh, uh, so in that sense, the same way that language you can learn when you are essentially like, I don't know, five years old, very young, essentially. I believe the same also applies for math and other things. I think some other things like that can be done. I think a good example is Terry Tao. I think he, it, also, I think I was reading that, uh, also there is another, uh, I think he got gold medal in, in, for, uh, in math Olympiad, uh, like not gold, I think he got uh, some medal essentially in the math Olympiad when he was 10 then 11 and uh, I think 12. And 12, I think he got gold, essentially. I think the first one was bronze. And that was means, essentially, he started very soon and he became essentially very famous mathematician, essentially. Got the Fields Medal, which is essentially equivalent of somehow a, a Nobel Prize uh, in other fields. Uh, and uh, the other example, I think there's another, uh, I mean, programmer, I think he got the like, champion of like this informatics Olympiad and also ACM programming contest. He's also very famous, and he just became like he's like I would say the best programmer in the world in terms of not hacking but really solving the problem. He also started when he was eight essentially and started this thing. So I believe that the same way that you learn essentially um, language at early age, you can actually do very well at math and other stuff at the early age. So that's the idea essentially for parents. That I mean that. If there is some opportunity, maybe actually you want to use this opportunity and essentially help your children essentially to do more uh, math or science in general, essentially. And so here that is one side. And I think one thing that I have it is that, I mean, listen to your child. If you see opportunities, I think use it. And I think it is good, of course, for professors and others that they are doing essentially research in a very high level to help such cases. Of course, not all cases can be done, but if there are some opportunities, I think it is very good for us. And I think Bill is talking about uh, the way that professors essentially can see the problem or not the problem. This is essentially the issue. Uh, these are the guide. I mean, the guidelines that they can use it essentially to be a better mentor for this uh, um, essentially a student. So I think you may want to just mention the summary of this ways that like professors can help essentially this. Okay. Um. So. Again, uh, be in contact, meet them regularly, give them things they can do that are doable, um, and uh, don't be obsessed with your own research program, and also scale down on stuff you know for them. Uh, and also, um, that's as a professor, as a parent, I would say, incidentally, or in my case, as a great uncle, um, you can also just give them easy math problems that come along. When I see my, nephew, my great nephews and nieces at Christmas time, I always ask them the following question. If there are 10 people in the room, which there are, if everyone hugs everyone, how many hugs are there? <laughs> so you can actually give them math questions based on things you see around them. Here's a harder one. Um, this happened when uh, we were all sitting at a table and 
everybody was sitting either next to or across from their spouse. And so I asked, if you have N couples come into a house and everyone sits at a table across from next to their spouse, how many ways can they do that? It's a bit harder. But the thing is, though, so as a parent or a professor, you can always see things in the real world and make a problem set out of them for them. Also, there are very easy things you can teach kids. I've worked on NIM with my great nephew and niece. I have worked on NIM games, which I won't get into that, what that is here. But the thing is, though, there are certain games you can play that are sort of mathematically based as well. So that, so that helps, too. But um, again, uh, also, um, if a student comes to you, oh, also, there are many levels. Some high school students come to me and they already know what they want to do. And for them, that's okay. They'll do it. And I'll give them some light guidance. So some I've been talking about, they come and don't know, don't know what they want to do. That's, that's quite common. Also, they come at times, it's amazing, even though I'm not in, say, security, I can still mentor a security project or a machine learning project because I know stuff. And I can sort of critique their stuff. That helps too. Uh, great. Yeah, I think these are uh, important. And again, I think for parents, I mean, that is important. I think I will say if you are doing essentially math, I mean, the, I don't know, science, physics, anything essentially engineering, and if you like your children is doing that, or even if you don't do it, but you want your children is doing that, I think try to uh, essentially start at earliest, uh, at earlier stages and try to, I mean, essentially provide some resources. The YouTube actually is a very good source of that. There are something like called math antics. I use actually a, a lot for, I mean, as my children are doing that. It's so very, I mean, nice and they have some nice jokes, etc. So that's very good things actually to do it. And I think that will help and I think help them because at early stage, you can actually start and learn the materials much faster, essentially. Yes. Although, oh, oh, the time yeah. become essential. Also, but make sure, okay, if you're working with somebody very young, and uh, but you want to also make sure they actually are interested in it. I mean, you don't want to force anything either. In fact, I will say Ilya is actually interested in photography for real, which is very nice. But um, exactly, I think that is very important. I think you should give also the choice. I think uh, that I try also to. I mean, do that. I mean, like for example, I'm not doing that much crypto, but I mean, he likes it. I think that is actually great. So you can give directions. But the issue is that there should be no force because I think it, is, it may backfire. If you yeah. force them, they may essentially become hate the area essentially, and don't want to go there. So you should be, I mean, essentially very, I mean, like, a, I mean, you can give the direction and let them essentially do that. Like for me, for my parents, actually, they were not doing, I mean, they were maybe, I mean, most of them were teachers, but none of them actually forced me to do anything essentially. I found essentially this, I mean, the way of essentially working more on algorithm. And then, again, we are talking about informatics, Olympiad, and other stuff that I wanted to be essentially, I mean, uh, I mean, a famous, I don't know famous, but I mean, I wanted to essentially do a good thing, essentially, uh, like math or CS. And I started at early stage, and I mean, they just didn't block me, and they didn't force me. I think that was already a very good thing. That was exactly the same thing that when we talked with Professor Elaine Shee previous time, also she mentioned that. I mean, essentially, she went to those areas without any force, and I mean, she essentially found the directions and do that. I think you, like as a parent, I feel that we should give directions, but no force at all, because that may backfire, essentially. Yeah, I, I also found math. My, my parents, both being in English, obviously I found math on my own. And uh, they, were, they, were, they were happy with that, certainly. They were, um, well, they, they might, although, although, of course, one strange thing, my parents have no idea what I work on <laughs> uh, because uh, yeah. math is hard. Uh, so, uh, what was, like, uh, I mean, uh, what was uh, your parents' job, essentially? Yeah, 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 yeah. Do... My mother was a teacher at a community college of English, and my father was a vice principal at a high school in charge of English. They both have their degrees in English. Okay. Great. Um, so I think we had some similarity here because both of my parents were also essentially teachers as well, essentially. Okay. So, but, that, so that is important, essentially. Yes. yes, yes. That, yeah, that and, can help, essentially. That's actually, a point is that even though they weren't in math, they gave me a nurturing intellectual atmosphere, which like, is important. And of yeah, course, I think and of course, my mom was and they, teaching had, the, and they, boy, didn't, yeah. they didn't say, Bill, you must be a doctor, you must be a lawyer, and like that. I mean, they were happy to have me do mathematics. And they were actually not that concerned with the job market, which is also an issue nowadays. Also, there's another point about math is um, if people majoring in, if you're, going to, if, you're high, if you're majoring in math, if, you, I don't know, if you're either your kid or yourself, I'm not sure, our audience probably has both parents and students in it. So both people, 
uh, parents and students, majoring in math is actually okay for the job market, so long as you pick up like comp sci or engineering as well to sort of make it better. So the, so the job market should not be a problem. And to make a joke here, if your kid's gonna major in art history, maybe then you wanna block them, I don't know. Because no, no, I mean, we don't want to say I think all areas, but if that's like that, you can be essentially, I mean, a very famous uh, historian as well, essentially. But uh, yeah, I think that's uh, something that, I think give directions and let them choose. Yeah. Uh, give the right directions essentially so i think so and i think probably you are famous in that one i don't know anyone how many uh, like high school or like something not undergrad you have mentored so far do you have yeah. a count i would say i've probably mentored over a hundred high school students i think probably you are unique i don't know anyone else who have done that essentially in the <laughs> maybe okay. essentially yeah i think i like this is i think that maybe it's not just blood that's actually uh, more famous because of just this one, essentially. Okay. And again, that situation is a help. And I think you had a very good, uh, I mean, students, and now lots of them are professors, essentially, at yeah, 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 I mean, uh, yeah. Thomas so, schools, essentially. Do you want to say some of some names, essentially? Well, let's see now. Um. Oh gosh. Oh. Uh, sorry, I don't. Sorry. Uh, uh, high school, yeah, Jacob Lurie got a PhD from, M he, 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 I think MIT. He was teaching at Harvard as a professor. He's now at the Institute for Advanced Study, but he won the MacArthur Genius Award and also three and a half million dollar for the Breakthrough Award. So that's obviously very good. Um, my students, James Pinkerton and Raphael Cetra, they won the, um, uh, a comp they won a competition here. They won the Siemens, they came in second in the Siemens competition. So that's very good. And um, a, a lot of them do, a lot of them win like low level prizes in the competitions as well. But uh, Jacob's, Jacob's the most famous one. No one else comes to mind immediately. Oh, um, oh yeah, Dave Baggett was one of the founders of Expedia. He was a student of mine. Oh, and Sergey Brin. Oh, this is embarrassing. Sergey Brin took discrete, not in high school. He took discrete math with me as an undergraduate here. Um, I would like to take credit for him, but I really can't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, Sergey Brin actually, you know, is. Uh co-founder of Google, essentially. Yeah. He got yeah. his, yeah. I think he hold, he's probably his only degree from Maryland. I that's think. right, that's he right. Went, he, he, he dropped out of Stanford. <laughs> yeah, and his father actually was a professor at Maryland, his math professor. That's so right, he's right. essentially, I think, one of the <laughs> wealthiest guy, I think, number four or five, essentially. Yeah. And I mean, he's a co-founder of Google, of course. Yeah. So that's important, actually. Like, uh, I think doing the right things actually can be very good for your children. I think yes. maybe he's uh, like, that was actually, Maryland was a very good one. And I think Bill is, I mean, very, one of the probably the best people uh, to work with. Okay, thank Especially you. for, I mean, like um, students. Uh, great, so uh, that's it. So anything else you want to add about the high school essentially training and other things that? Oh, just that it is very, I, I will warn you, on the one hand, it's very rewarding in that I learn a lot and I see them learn things. On the other hand, it is time consuming. So frankly, I would probably not recommend people to do it before they get tenure. Maybe it's maybe sort of cynical there because you really have to get your own research prog program in order. And also it takes a certain maturity as well to know how to do it and how to do it right. So, but I would say it, it is rewarding. Uh, and the nice thing about high school students, here's a funny thing, for a PhD student, if they actually don't succeed, that's kind of bad. He wastes a lot of time, et cetera. High school students, they learn things. If they just learn things and do things and don't get out anything original, that's fine. My gosh, they're high school students. So I mean, and sort of, and relish that. It's kind of, it's kind of a nice throwback to an, early, to an earlier era where it's okay to just learn things and do things. Uh, great. Yeah, so and I think somebody asked essentially, what is the, I mean, what is the topic? So we were talking about essentially uh, a student like means oh. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll there. Okay, yeah. So um, let's see, I've had a lot of students work. Uh, um, some of you know, I work on this problem called the muffin problem. I've had probably about 20 students at various times work on the muffin problem, having to do with fair division of, of goods. Uh, I've had a lot of students working in Ramsey theory or scale down Ramsey theory. Um, I've had more recently machine learning. Here's a, maybe an odd thing. I don't know any machine learning, but I have problems that can be solved by machine learning and, and the students themselves are very good. They learn PyTorch and other things. So I've supervised some machine learning projects, a little bit awkward, I don't really know it that well. Cryptography, as you, as you well know, I have had students try out new ciphers and things, or, or just, just even learning the old ciphers is good too.
Okay. Oh, sorry, I got to mute. Okay. Oh, yeah, here. Uh, I'm plug I had to plug in my phone, so my, my head's looking in a funny position now. Here. Okay, so the point is, yeah, so um, as I was saying um, briefly, um, combinatorics, Ramsey theory, cryptography, muffin problem, of course, in my case, have been standard topics that I've done things on. Um, I've had several students code up the quadratic CIF factoring algorithm, which is kind of a hard algorithm. Um, and more recently, machine learning has been a topic I've supervised students on, although um, they have to do the machine learning. Yeah, so I think uh, we have, and yes, I'm here. I don't know if it is my internet problem or your internet. I don't know if one of us has the issue essentially. I don't know, okay. Um, well, hopefully it will happen again, and also we're almost, okay, anyway, so, but we're, we're, we're here now, which is fine. Okay, I can't quite tell. Yeah, so, um, did it, did yeah this is a good definition. Okay, so uh, I think, uh, uh, let me ask, uh, so, uh, by the way, we want to, I think, make sure that, I mean, you are in the center, essentially. Okay, well, okay, there we go. Yeah, good, yeah. Uh, great. So, okay, so I think now we can go to the next, I mean, topic, essentially, about the books. We want to talk about the books that you had, essentially. Okay, yes, 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 okay, good. Yes, um. I've written, let me see now, I've written three books and I'm writing a fourth one with, as you know, which, as you know, okay, I'll tell you what they actually were. The first one, I'm not, I'm not sure even Mohammed knows about. Um, so as I said earlier, I was always interested in the question of given a problem, how hard is it? So early on, I did research on the following. The halting problem is given a program, will it halt? That's actually undecidable. So no program can do that. But I asked the question, well, what if it could? Are three queries, if I, could, if I had a program that could actually ask the halting problem five questions. Could it do more than when it asks it four questions, say? So I have an entire book entitled Bounded Queries and Recursion Theory. And um, I got that out in 91. And uh, I'm very happy with it. On the one hand, I'm happy with it in that I had this branch, I had this research, mostly it was my research and some co-authors, and I got to consolidate it all into one place, which I liked. Uh, I will, let's just say it hasn't sold that well. <laughs> <laughs> Not a surprise, but I am happy with it, though, and it, it actually is a good place to read up on that field, because every, everything's there pretty much. Uh, much more recently, that was 91. Much more recently, after blogging for about 15, 20, oh my gosh, 15 years, I decided I would actually um, I'll put my blogs into, uh, take my blog posts and put them into a book, although it's not as easy, easy as it sounds, because you take a blog post, it's not just the spelling and grammar you got to fix. Also, wow, what more is known? Do I also include people's comments on it? And can I now tell a more coherent story about it? I think I would often take three or four blog posts and make them a chapter. So the, the book is Problems with a Point. Exploring Mathematics and Computer Science is essentially a book of, I, I, I want to say, not quite blog posts, but inspired by my posts. And I have um, the first few chapters are kind of lighter reading. Uh, essentially, things like, let me take a, a cute one. Um, in base, base um, the first chapter is entitled Sports Defy the Rules of Logic. Like in baseball, the home plate's dimensions don't work. They claim it's the right triangle, but it's not satisfied by Pythagorean, Pythagoras' theorem. So essentially, um, I do things like that. I, I, I do things like, how, how do, do people use mathematical terms in real life incorrectly? They mostly do. Um, anyway, so... Um, yeah, can you try to be in the center? That would be great. Oh, sorry. sorry okay, yeah, so here we are. Am I in the center, center now? Yeah, okay. So, I mean, just in short, I mean, so many. So, what are, what are the titles of the book, essentially? I think okay, the, 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 the first book is Problems with a Point, Exploring Math and Their Science. That's actually my blog book. The next book was uh, Mathematical Muffin Morsels Because Nobody Wants a Small Piece. That was on the muffin problem. So, I'll, I'll talk about that now. Um, so, let's say you have five muffins and three people. Okay, got that? And you want to give everybody five-thirds. You could cut each muffin in thirds and give, every, and give everybody five thirds of five one third pieces. And then everyone gets these small pieces. Can you actually divide five muffins for, four, for three people so that the biggest piece, no, so, so the smallest piece is bigger than one third? Um, turns out you can. It turns out there's a way of doing it so the smallest piece is actually five twelfths. That may seem somewhat innocent. And in fact, I first spotted this problem in a pamphlet about recreational mathematics. But I said, my goodness, what if you had M muffins and S students? And I kept on working on the problem, and I, thought I, would, hit a, I would hit a roadblock. I would find some co-authors that would help me. I will go around the roadblock. And before I knew it, I had 400 pages So um, on muffins. So the thing is, though, this is, let me, uh, more, more abstractly, though, when is a field of math interesting? It's kind of, uh, it's kind of uh, circular. 
it's interesting if it leads to math of interest. In this case, we would work on the problems of like three muffins and five people, whatever. We hit a wall. 11 muffins, five people we could not solve with our current methods, so we got new methods, and that made it go forward more. About five, six times, we hit a wall and got around it in ways that were interesting. And this is not the kind of thing you can do in an article. This is just, this is just way too big. So uh, I wrote the article. I wrote the book with co-authors. Um, oh, yeah, Daniel Smoliak, Jacob Prince, and Eric Metz. They were all undergrads at Maryland, um, and oh, and uh, that that book came out this last year. And I went up, and Problems of the Point came out two years ago. I should point out that was co-authored with Clyde Kreskel. Uh, Clyde, not even though Lance is my co-blogger, Clyde he didn't want really, he didn't want really be involved with this, but Clyde very much helped me polish things and expand things and like that. And he certainly earned his co-authorship uh, as such. And so I lo- so those are my those are my three books: Bound Equations and Recursion Theory, a long time ago; uh, Problems of the Point, more recently, a uh, blog book; and Muffin Book, also more recently. And uh, Mohammed, should me or you talk about our book? Yeah, I think you can just mention that. Okay, yeah. So I'll I'll go. Okay, our book. So um. We don't, have a, we don't have a title yet, but essentially um, our book is going to look at NP completeness and various other problems now. It's, oh, okay, the, the, the working title not the real, is Fun with Hardness. We prove certain problems are hard, and we prove certain games are hard, like chess being uh, X space complete. And, um, and, or maybe it's X time complete, I forget which. Anyway, so the point is that we go through lots of problems proving they're hard to solve, hard to approximate, or on a lower level, some problems we can get much more lower level, like you can't do this, it, this, this problem probably requires n cubed time. The problem requires n squared time. So we sort of run the gamut from like n squared up to exponential space on each level, sort of saying what we can or can't do in that framework. Okay, is that a good summary? You want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, yeah that is essentially, I mean, this something essentially would be Gary Johnson is the, the most famous book probably in computer science. That hopefully would be the next that covered lots of areas. This is the book piece. Me, Bill, and Eric Demain of MIT, essentially. So yep. that's the thing that hopefully, I mean, will be there. Essentially, I think maybe in a, I mean, probably the earlier versions, it is already ready. I mean, <laughs> but we will just polish it more and more. I think hopefully in a year it will be there as well if the people want to do that. Uh, good. So I think we talk about the books, essentially. And uh, yeah, but the way, one person actually mentioned the comment that I think when the children are children, you should let them play. I mean, I think this yeah. thing that we mentioned, I mean, I think that is there is no contradiction. So I try essentially like, and again, this is not a suggestion that everyone should do that. And we just mentioned these are, you should give direction. Maybe they are good at a sport. You should give them essentially the opportunity to do a sport. Like when I was a children, actually I was playing, I mean, a ping pong essentially, quite uh, actually in a professional way as well. Right. And then uh, also like, uh, for example, for my children, I try to, I mean, that actually I have a girl and a uh, boy that are like six and nine. I try to, I mean, teach them more about essentially swimming. I think these are, there is nothing different between, so you can do all of them if yeah. you want. And if you don't want, I mean, that's fine. If your children don't want, that's fine completely. And I mean, you should just give the directions. If you think this is a good direction, I mean, then you should do that. And this, you can see lots of people, I mean, like they are famous, essentially, um, scientists, maybe their children become scientists. Maybe fa- a famous uh, tennis player, their children become tennis players. Some, I mean, may become, some may not become. And again, this is up to you. I think give the directions, but the right directions, essentially, and let them choose. That's the whole idea. Yeah. If they want to do it math or not math, doesn't matter. I mean, uh, that's up also, to you. Also, and, other things, yeah. I mean, not just math, they, they can do, you know, art. there's math, there's art. If some students want to draw, that's cool too. Okay, um, if some students want to swim, that's cool too. Yeah. So, so yeah, Mohammed and I are talking about if your if your kids want to do math or have some interest, how to nurture it. But absolutely right, if they don't do something else, and they can play at the same time. I mean, um, I mean, Ilya, I'm sure plays as well as does math. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. The, but, 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 but but the uh, the commenter did have a good point though. I think it's good to, it's good to reiterate that point though. So kudos to the commenter. Yeah. That sounds great, essential. Okay. Uh, good. So I think uh, that's, uh, I mean, uh, like uh, the other thing is that I think, like maybe related to this, do you have any message for a student, essentially? I mean, this may be high school or undergrads and PhD students that they are doing in STEM field, essentially. STEM means okay. science, technology, essentially, engineering, and math, essentially. Okay. Make sure you're enjoying what you're, make sure you're enjoying what you're looking at and make sure, uh, follow your curiosity. 
if you if you think something interesting, follow it uh, relentlessly and uh, feed on your curiosity and um, make sure you're always learning and doing things. Don't be fr- if you're working on a problem and you can't solve it. That's okay. Read more about it. So use it as an excuse to read more literature and learn more about it. So don't be worried about getting stuck on things. And also the most important thing is make sure what you're working on is interesting and make sure that you know why you're working on it. As a side note, I don't like when someone says, I'm working on X because my advisor told me to work on X. No, no. Why do you want to work on it? It's okay initially if your advisor tells you to work on it, but you should also find out, make sure you're interested in it as well. And um, do what you can do and learn, always learn, learn, learn. As Mohammed said earlier, become well-rounded. Don't just learn comp sci and math. I mean, learn things. Don't, don't just learn. Don't just be the world's leading authority on muffins. <laughs> also, expand out from there. Yeah, can you just be in the middle? That's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, so can you just try to make your head oh, in the middle? Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, that's good, yeah. Okay, yeah, so I think that was the summary of everything that we discussed, like even for blogging. I mean, you want to be a successful blogger. You want to essentially be, I mean, if, if you are a professor, you want to teach essentially high school or elementary school or things about your field. I think the main issue is that try. I mean, yes, maybe this, uh, I mean, this thing that you are doing is not the best, but try your best essentially to do that and continue and have the persistency in doing that. That's very important. I think trying, I mean, constantly, that's essentially the key to success. And Uh, that's the thing that you should do it essentially. And of course, I mean, you should try to enjoy it, but I didn't say that every time is enjoyable. Like try and enjoy Sometimes are the same, not all the time the same. But I think the path to success is more trying, and of course, thinking what you should do it next. Uh, but try hard, essentially. Yeah. But well, Hammond, I want to I give a quote. I'm not sure, I'm not sure you know this quote, uh, that Thomas Edison said, genius is 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. So Exactly. So I think that's another thing that I should quote from you, essentially. That essentially, 99% is persistency, essentially, to do these things. And just maybe 1% percent essentially. Also, on a funnier note, uh, there's also a famous quote here. Um, I think it was Woody Allen said, um, 90% of life is just showing up. So, <laughs> so get out there and do things. Yeah, I think that's the important thing, essentially, that I think you should do. Mm-hmm. Uh, do that. So I think, uh, yeah, I think we are uh, done essentially with the topics. We, have. we talk about everything. I think blocking, uh, essentially, higher school training, about Zcash and zero knowledge. So it's like essentially nice topic that essentially related to uh, bills, uh, P versus MP, essentially. And uh, I think we, I mean, that's the opinion that we had it again. That is our opinion. We don't say that anyone should should or should not do that. It's our like, I think that we believe in it, essentially. And uh, great. So is there anything that you want to add, essentially, I think, at the end? Oh, me? Let's see now. Just um, have fun, and I'm glad I have fun, and I want to thank you for this uh, opportunity. Yeah, uh, thank you, much actually, for coming. I think we have this study that I mentioned. Uh, so next week, we are talking with Professor Richard Kull of NYU. That will be more on the game theory, essentially. And again, these are a series of things that hopefully, I mean, a little bit about our life, and also the way that we are thinking. And I mean, if you are interested in science and technology and others, I think that would be a good thing to maybe listen. You can just read it essentially as a, uh, uh, I mean, as a podcast essentially, just um, put it on the YouTube and then you will just listen essentially. We will put the YouTube ones as well essentially. I think it will be available through uh, Bill's uh, blog as well essentially. So that's essentially the idea. Again, I mean, we are doing that exactly because of that. I mean, not because of the number of people who are live now. I think that's the thing that we think it is the correct thing for the world. We try to do that essentially. And I think that is useful. So that's the whole idea that we have it for this. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thanks, uh, audience, essentially those who came here and those that they will listen at the, essentially the online version, like the recording of that essentially to YouTube or from Instagram and other places. Okay. I think at this point, I think, uh, yeah, thank Bill for coming. Thank, thank, thank Adrian. And I think we will continue next week again. Uh, we will talk about this and other right. okay. subjects essentially coming okay. in the future weeks. Okay. Uh, thank you. Bye for now. Bye-bye.